Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jeremy Eichler is a music critic, historian, and a musicologist. He is currently the chief music critic at the Boston Globe. He's taught at Brandeis University. Uh, he received his PhD at Columbia University, where his dissertation was awarded the Salo and Jeanette Barron Prize in Jewish Studies uh, for the best dissertation over a five-year period. He's a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, where he's working on a book focusing on, in his own words, key commemorative works, the idea of memorialization in sound, and the notion of music itself as a unique carrier of meaning about the past. Dr. Eichler has also served as a music critic for the New York Times, has written for The Nation, The New Yorker, and The New Republic, and has won the ASCAP Deems Taylor Award for his work. He'll speak to us this morning on a phenomenon as remarkable as the music itself, reception, critical assessment, and the musical memorial. Please give him a warm welcome. Thanks very much, Mike, and thank, thank you all for being here. Great. Uh, I think that it was an inspired uh, judgment by, by the, the planners of today's flow of events to put my talk right after Brett's. That was a fascinating talk, Brett, and I think that, as you'll hear, I'm going to be coming at some of some very similar issues uh, addressed to a, a, a different repertoire and in, in many ways um, approaching them as a historian of memory as much as uh, um, a, 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 this different kind of approach we just heard from Brett, which, uh, which was looking at, um, at a different repertoire. And uh, we'll, we'll see what, what the talks have to say to each other once we're done. Uh, I'd like to, I'm speaking today about that elusive uh, species of work we might call uh, the modern musical memorial. These pieces, in a way, don't behave like other works of music. They come out, uh, if you will, only at night. And if other works of abstract music can play Stravinsky in games of semantic hide-and-seek, now you see my meaning, now you don't. Most memorials are expressly about something in particular. There's no denying it. They are meant to commemorate, to bear witness to war, to the Shoah, to human suffering. Readers of Proust won't need much prompting to recognize the power of music to invoke personal memory. One only needs to mention Swan's reaction to what he calls the little phrase in a sonata by the novel's fictional composer and how this music sets off upwellings of personal memory, eventually becoming what Proust rather charmingly refers to as the national anthem of his love for Odette. But the musical memorial does more than just tap into music's mysterious mnemonic properties on an individual level. While its creation is often a deeply personal act for the composer, its performance involving musicians, choristers, concert hall staff, and of course a large audience, typically becomes a broader cultural event. We might even call it a public performance of collective memory. Because the musical memorial is doing all of these things, because it's about so much more than, quote, just music, I've often wondered how such works should be judged. Judged in the present, of course, on the one hand, and I'll just say here some of my most uncomfortable moments as a music critic have been squirming through a performance of a new memorial work where the noblest commemorative intentions can sometimes seem at painful odds with aesthetic choices. But there's also the question of how historians, concert programmers, or really any of us audience members should approach the major memorial works of the past. To put it another way, when we look to these historic pieces, especially works that were addressing the commemorative needs of a different era, should we think of these scores as art with all the implied values of timelessness and universal communicative power, or as artifact, an object one cannot entirely separate from its own time and place? On a related note, how should we understand the frankly bizarre history that often attends the premieres of these works? The title of my talk refers to just that, 
The quote is from Stravinsky, who observed the incredible, popular, and critical praise that had been lavished on Britain's war requiem before a single note had been performed. The piece's, that piece's reception, the way it consumed the post-war British public to a degree that he had never witnessed before, was, in Stravinsky's words, a phenomenon as remarkable as the music itself. But I'm actually not here to speak about the Britain. Rather, I believe that no work illustrates this evocative, if, perfl if perplexing, swirl of aesthetics, history, and memory more palpably than Schoenberg's A Survivor from Warsaw, perhaps the most famous musical memorial to address the Holocaust, and certainly among the very first works of concert music uh, to address the Holocaust written by a major uh, European composer after the war. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, this is a seven minute work uh, for narrator, male chorus, and orchestra. It was, uh, in a way, um, commissioned by Serge Kusevitsky. Uh, uh, though the archives suggest that Kusevitsky actually had no idea that he would be getting a memorial work as such. Uh, here's the title page of the work, written in 1947. And uh, just incidentally, I found it interesting. Schoenberg had a, a fraught relationship with a lot of different conductors. Uh, he was not a big admirer of, um, of Kusevitsky's conducting. Uh, and I just thought it found it fascinating on a kind of level of a Freudian slip that if you'll notice, there's a misspelling on the title page of Kusevitsky's last name. Uh, the piece was written right here, I, I don't think I mentioned, here in Los Angeles um, in 47. Uh, but right from the moment of its birth, this, book, this work took on a very strange path into the world. Kusevitsky almost always premiered the works he commissioned with his own Boston Symphony Orchestra, but not this time. Kusevitsky essentially took a pass on this piece. I believe it was because it was, uh, simply put, too shocking for its era. Uh, we, I don't have time to play a full recording here, but uh, some of you know the piece already. If, for those who don't, it has a text for narrator written by Schoenberg that describes a scene in a concentration camp with prisoners being beaten and counted off for the gas chamber. If you look, on the other hand, at Kusevitsky's opening address to the incoming students at Tanglewood, or what was then called the Berkshire Music Center, during the first summers after the war, they're full of a very different kind of lofty rhetoric about music restoring our humanity, classical works returning to the world its vanished sense of sanity. Music's goal in that moment, as Kusevitsky saw it, was most certainly not to depict the barbarism itself in its raw form. It was supposed to rescue us from the abyss and not return us to it. With Kusevitsky out of the picture, the world premiere of Survivor from Warsaw, uh, now, as we said, perhaps the most famous musical memorial to the Holocaust, took place uh, in a university uh, gymnasium at the University of New Mexico uh, in Albuquerque. It was performed by amateur forces. There were secretaries and florists in the orchestra. There were cowboys and ranch hands in the chorus. And the narrator, um, the archives tell us, was the head of the university chemistry department. The performance was conducted by this man, by Kurt Frederick, an Austrian Jewish emigre violinist who had been born Kurt Fuchsgelb, and he had been a director in a famous Viennese, music director in a famous Viennese synagogue. Uh, he had been a, also been a violinist active in Vienna's new music scene before the war. When he first came to the country, he played briefly in the Kolisch Quartet. Uh, he did not, it seems, subscribe to Kusevitsky's trepidation about musical memory that went to the heart of the horror itself. He was no stranger to that experience. He had escaped Vienna on the eve of the Anschluss and had lost his own mother in the Holocaust. Uh, they're out of order, but this slide right here is the, the um, death notice that appeared after the war in the Vienna papers for uh, Kurt Frederick's mother. Uh, Frederick was astounded that one of his heroes, Arnold Schoenberg, would entrust him with the world premiere of one of his works, given his setup in Albuquerque as conductor of the local 
uh, amateur orchestra. He took his assignment extremely seriously. Still, the score was very difficult and the premiere had to be postponed. Eventually, however, the day came, uh, one day in November in 1948. Here's the program. Many national publications sent correspondence. Time and Newsweek were there. Uh, Schoenberg in Albuquerque read uh, the headline in the New York Times, sounding very much like the setup for some kind of joke. Uh, one of these things the paper would seem to imply simply did not go with the other. We might picture a Zacher tort at a southern barbecue. Uh, but seemingly against all odds, the premiere was in fact a resounding success. One press report estimated the audience numbering at 1,500 people. Time magazine said that, quote, applause thundered in the auditorium. The response was so enthusiastic that the work had to be repeated. Just after midnight on the night of the premiere, an elated Kurt Frederick fired off a telegram to Schoenberg stating, survivor from Warsaw made tremendous impression upon performers and audience. Needless to say, Schoenberg was thrilled by the reports he received. He couldn't make it for the premiere himself. Uh, writing back to Frederick and calling, he called it nothing short of a miracle. This arch-modernist, so accustomed to his music being met with skepticism at best, hailed, quote, this wonderful attitude toward a new work, unquote. He suggested that the audiences in Albuquerque become, quote, a model to many, many other places, unquote. He even wondered whether this was perhaps signaling a larger turning point. Maybe, just maybe, America was, after all, finally coming around to his 12-tone music. Pulling back for a moment, what we can ask, what was going on here? Cowboys singing Schoenberg in the desert, thundering applause, the likes of which had perhaps not been heard for a Schoenberg work since the premiere of Girl Leader in 1913. Stravinsky was on to something, I suggest. Reception of these kinds of works as a phenomenon as remarkable as the music itself. The plot thickens further when one realizes that in the nearly seven decades since its premiere, Survivor from Warsaw has elicited an extraordinary range of responses, a range I think is probably unmatched with, uh, with to, to any of his other works. Typically, a critical consensus coalesces around a work over the course of uh, the first few years, if not the first few decades. Not here. Let's take a quick look at the range of responses this piece, A Survivor from Warsaw, has generated over the years. There were, of course, uh, like those first audiences, early commentators who hailed the work. Hans Keller, uh, the uh, emigre, uh, uh, Austrian emigre critic based in London, uh, said it was destined to be one of the very few survivors from our war-worn musical age. Luigi Nono called it the aesthetic and musical manifesto of our epoch. Robert Kraft, uh, Robert Kraft called the work's ending in which the male chorus sings a portion of the Shema Yisrael prayer as, quote, one of the most moving moments in 20th century music. Uh, and here, just to give a little bit more texture from a different premiere, um, is a description from uh, Rene Leibovitz, who gave the piece's first European performances in 1949. It was the extraordinary newness of the work that so gripped my audience. Many of them came to me with tears in their eyes. Others were so shocked that they could not even speak and only talked to me about their impressions much later. But not only the audiences, audience were impressed in this way. From the first rehearsal onward, the entire orchestra and chorus were so moved that there was none of the usual resistance one tends to meet in rehearsing a new work of such difficulty. Rehearsals proceeded in the greatest calm and with a seriousness I have but rarely met. On the one hand, from almost the very beginning, the work also had, on the other hand, I should say, from the, almost the very beginning, the work had its detractors. In the New York Times, reviewing the 1950 premiere, which was uh, conducted by Metropolis in the New York Philharmonic, uh, Olin Downs wrote that it was poor and empty music. Others criticized the text, the text which was written by Schoenberg, the one that the narrator recites, saying that it, quote, it makes, this is from early article in Commentary Magazine, also in the very early years, quote, it makes the immense tragedy begin to stand, sound stale and melodramatic. In more recent years, the most memorable attack came from the distinguished musicologist Richard Taruskin, who eviscerated the work in the pages of the New York Times. 
where its musical idiom not safeguarded by its inscrutability, its B-movie cliches, the kitsch triumphalism of the climactic, suddenly tonal singing of the Jewish credo would be painfully obvious, and no one would ever think to program such banality alongside Beethoven's Ninth as has become fashionable. That kind of post-Auschwitz poetry is indeed a confession of art's impetus. I wish I had time to go into more detail about, uh, about um, the premiere itself and all uh, some of these other reactions that the works accumulated over the years. But in the time that we have left, I'd like to suggest to you that in evaluating this historically very important work, people have uh, not been so much finding the wrong answers as they've been asking the wrong questions. I'd like to try to suggest some different ones and I'll offer some more generalized thoughts about how we might approach musical memorials today, how we can make sense of this impl tension implicit in what I would call their twin status as art and artifact, how we might think about their history, their present day impact, and what might be a more holistic criteria for judging them. I use the word holistic because I think we do these works a disservice by thinking about them too narrowly. Whether we call it a hyper-musicality or an extra-musicality, it's clear there is more going on here than, quote, just music. Just like the, uh, pieces like Survivor clearly take on a symbolic status. They reach beyond the formal boundaries of the aesthetic to gauge with and at times collide with the needs and narratives of both public and private memory. In the former category, that of public memory, this collision can have near fatal consequences for a memorial. This is true in particular when a work is seen as threatening official state narratives of a war's history, or even the state's definition of the victims and the perpetrators. Even a cursory look at, the musical, at musical memorialization of a Second World War in the former Soviet Union bears out this point. The um, this isn't a musical example, but the, sculpt the sculptor uh, Nathan Rappaport's proposal of a monument to the, Wars uh, the Warsaw Ghetto uprising was rejected by Stalin's art committee, arts committee for being essentially too Jewish. A similar fate befell Ilya Ehrenberg's literary memorial, The Black Book of Soviet Jewry. The trend continued into the 1960s. Under threat of cancellation, the text of Shostakovich's Babi Yar Symphony was revised to bring its description of Jewish victims into conformity with Soviet tropes of commemoration. In that official Soviet narrative, the Babi Yar massacre could not be particularized as a slaughter of the Jews. Rather, it had to be presented as a broadly cross-cutting event whose victims were simply Soviets. What I'm calling, what I've called this extra musicality, this enlarged semantic and rhetor rhetorical terrain occupied by a musical memorial can also work in the score's favor, especially when a piece appears to address the needs of individual mourning or private memory. John Fould's uh, World Requiem caused a sensation at its London premiere in the Royal Albert Hall in 1923, breaking all box office records. The numbers of dead in the First World War would suggest that so many in that audience had suffered the direct loss of a friend or a family member. By the end of the 1920s, however, despite the ecstatic praise generated by the premiere, the work had completely disappeared. I'm guessing many of you here today may have never even heard of John Fould's or of the World Requiem. Clearly, in that early post-war moment, the work's poetic ability to address the immediate needs of its audiences was almost impossible to separate from its artistic merits, or perhaps the limits thereof. The first step in understanding the reception of these works, uh, in other words, is simply to recognize the extra musical status they occupy, their place, if you will, on a culture's memory landscape. In the case of, this, of Survivor from Warsaw, we have to recall that this was one of the very first high-profile works of post-Holocaust memory art in any medium. Because of this, it pressed up against the limits of post-war memory itself during its earliest years. When it was written in 1947, the war was far from a distant memory. It, not, it had not been placed in what Jean Emery has called the cold, storage of his, the cold storage of history. Memory at this time was raw, undigested, 
heterodox experience, one with its own associated taboos. At the time the work premiered, there was still not a single built memorial to the Holocaust anywhere in America. No one had heard of a Dutch girl named Anne Frank. The, Paul, his, the historian Raoul Hilberg had been discouraged from writing a dissertation on the extermination camps at Columbia University. People did not use the word Holocaust, nor did they particularize it as an event that targeted the Jews as such. In 1947, again, the same year that Schoenberg composed Survivor from Warsaw, the Polish parliament declared the camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau would be, quote, forever preserved as a memorial to the martyrdom of the Polish nation and other peoples, unquote. No wonder the good citizens of Albuquerque were stunned by this piece of music. Tellingly, despite the choral singing of the Shema Yisrael prayer at the work's conclusion, one reviewer appears to have completely missed the fact that the prisoners in this score were meant to be seen as Jews. Writing in the Albuquerque Journal, this critic, perhaps thrown off by the title of the work, refers to the prisoners uh, represented by Schoenberg as Poles. I think that in approaching Schoenberg's score today or any other memorial, we have to do so not only as listeners, but as listeners aware of these broader contexts. I mean more particularly that we have to avoid committing the memory equivalent of what historians call backshadowing, that is judging the past through the standards of the present, or in this case, judging one of the very first works of Holocaust memory art through the prism of our own post-Spielbergian memory-saturated culture. This work's unabashed directness, survivors' unabashed directness, its willingness to make a big statement, the very quality critics such as Taruskin and others have derided as kitsch were what set the work apart from many of its most perceptive first listeners. Theodore Adorno hailed Survivor as one of the only appropriate responses to the Holocaust since it was one of the few works, like Picasso's Guernica, that brought history's barbarism directly into its own frame. This was the only way Adorno wrote for music to regain its raison d'etre following the war. He also understood immediately that the work represented a radical departure for Schoenberg himself, a pivot towards history, maybe even a pivot toward the idea of an audience. Quote, in the midst of the blindness of specialization, Adorno wrote, his music suddenly saw the light that shines beyond the aesthetic realm. To build off of Adorno's comment, we could uh, say that to the extent that a piece like Survivor's range of meanings quite obviously extends beyond the realm of the aesthetic, so too must our evaluative criteria. As James Young has written in reference to stone monuments, quote, we cannot separate the monument from its public life. The social function of such art is its aesthetic performance. So perhaps to come full circle, a different set of criteria is needed, perhaps because the works we are discussing are fired precisely by their proximity to a history being memorialized. We should not forget about that closeness when judging them. Perhaps we may even be slightly more lenient with their aesthetic sins. In reference to architectural monuments to the Holocaust, again, Andreas Hussen has wisely called for reintegrating their public dimension back into our understanding, rather than judging the monument solely as, quote, aesthetic sculpture. Hussein writes, quote, the criteria for a monument's success could therefore be the ways in which it allows for a crossing of boundaries toward other discourses of the Holocaust, the way it pushes us toward reading other texts, other stories. I think there is a lot of wisdom here for musical monuments too. The music we are all discussing here often lives a kind of double life that cannot be pulled apart as art and artifact. I'm uh, working on a book project now I hope to show, in which I hope to show just how many texts, how many stories lie behind Schoenberg's particular monument. Those stories cannot rightly be stripped away from the work itself, and yet that appears to be what happens again and again. Perhaps this is the inheritance of a kind of 19th, of a kind of 19th century positivism, uh, or perhaps here it flows from Schoenberg's own tendency, and especially that of his followers, to speak of music in vast teleological terms as carrying forward the march of musical progress. But for whatever reason, certain, certain personal facts about Schoenberg's wartime life remain 
shockingly obscure. Many in this room may have known before this weekend that Schoenberg spent the war years right here in LA, but I wonder how many knew that he lost his own brother in the Holocaust. Professional scholars of the Second Viennese School have sheepishly confessed to me that they never actually knew this fact. But it's true, and the next time you're in Salzburg, you can find your way to a square colorfully named Papagenoplatz. Heinrich Schoenberg lived there in a former municipal building. He lived in a municipal building because he was married to the daughter of the mayor of, Sal of Salzburg. And here, outside his house, is a very small plaque laid into the pavement. The history, this history is not irrelevant for understanding Survivor from Warsaw, either its content or some of the burning intensity of its form. Schoenberg was deeply invested in the idea of German culture and invested in the idea of himself as its Moses, as its Moses figure, prepared, prepared to lead music, German music, to its promised land. After the war, and the war affected him too personally, too directly, to compose a memorial of a cooler, more somber, or a reflective mean than Survivor from Warsaw. As a result, I would say his work retains its power to draw strong responses, to disturb, maybe to offend our sensibilities, and, but also in a way I would suggest are, uh, is unique to musical, musical memorials as a genre. It has an ability to connect the world of a present day listener to, uh, to, a vast, uh, to a much vaster and more sweeping history that remains behind its notes. We do ourselves a disservice not to acknowledge the extra musical resonance of these recovered voices more broadly, or to suggest that this repertoire must earn our attention by virtue of their aesthetic merits alone. To say that does not mean we can't also love, in some cases, the way these pieces sound. It does mean that this should not be a requirement for giving them our care. In fact, I'd go as far as saying that part of the charisma of all of these recovered voices works, to speak a bit the genre broadly, has to do with their proximity to the history which their creators have in, to which their creators have in some way borne witness. These musical statements, these recovered voices, may be contrasted with the ceaseless stream of ersatz memory, the reenactment-centered cinematic representations of the Holocaust that saturate the media today, numb the sensibilities, and I would argue leave a hunger for actual works of art from the period that carry with them an aura of authenticity. The historian Saul Friedlander has posed an important question. He asked whether at the collective level, quote, an event such as the Shoah may, after all this all the survivors have disappeared, leave traces of a deep cultural memory that are beyond individual recall. If such a deep memory is in fact carried forward, not just of the Shoah itself, but of the brief yet vibrant flowering of German Jewish culture in Europe, it will be precisely through these authentic works, works of art from the period a survivor from Warsaw among them. Finally, I would go one step further and say that part of music, music's unique power as a memorial medium is that if we are willing to hear it, there is to be found a kind of dual chronology contained inside of every work, a bridge between the present tense of the composer at the moment of its composition and the present tense of the listener at the moment of its performance. Or to put it another way, we can, music can give us access to a kind of felt continuity with the past an intuitive grasp of the truism that W.G. Zabald captured eloquently when he once wrote that, quote, time measures nothing but itself. Thank you. And now, perhaps some questions from the audience. Yes, please, Lou. This is a great paper. Thank you very much. Um, your point about the connection between art as both art and artifact, um, I would say is true of all music. Uh, do you think that can ever be pulled apart? Is this a special case, or is your point valid for all music? That's a great question. I mean, I think that there are aspects of this way of thinking that you could certainly extend to all music. I do feel, though, that, that um, memory 
art as such, commemorate, commemorative art um, works, is kind of making a different set of claims on our attention, our, on our sensibilities, on our connections to the past. And so um, one of my goals in this project has been to find an equally um, responsive set of, of terms with which to, to evaluate it, to think about it, um, to, not, to not judge it, um, to not judge against it the very qualities that make it what it is. Yeah. Yes, please. Dude, yes. Yes. So by having his piece performed in Albuquerque, is that because he was pissed off at Boston? I think there was an element of kind of, you know, um, sticking it to Kusevitsky, uh, but I, I it was also this, uh, Kurt Frederick sought him out actually, and somehow the, uh, the word had got around, there had been brief references in the press that this piece had been written, um, and, uh, and Frederick wrote to Schoenberg in Los Angeles and said, I uh, hear you have a new piece for chamber orchestra, chorus, and narrator, um, if you, if you, uh, it might we take a look at the score because I conduct a group here. We'd love to promote your music for our community that knows that doesn't know it very well at all. Schoenberg wrote back, uh, "Yes, I can uh, send you the score, but if you decide to perform it, you're going to have to produce the performance parts yourself." And Frederick saw this, and um, you can one can imagine him almost, you know, spitting out his proverbial tea. Uh, um, he was he was shocked, and he said, I, I, "He wrote back, I just want to make sure." that I'm correct in my understanding that if I have to prepare the performance parts, does this mean that you're entrusting us with the world premiere of the score? Schoenberg said, yes, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, please. And, and what, what do you think of this musical? Um, that's, that's really interesting. I, it, it's funny when you get so close to these things, you sometimes, uh, it, um, I've spent a lot of time with the piece. I've come to grow sympathetic to it. I can absolutely understand the charges against it, against its kitsch, against its overwroughtness. Um, but I do also think, I, I do then, I, I, I interrogate those charges in a way as, as, being, as, as being a little bit ahistorical um, for, because of wh where we are now um, as, as a culture that's really 180 degrees away from where Schoenberg was and where, where the audience was at that time uh, in terms of Holocaust memory. Um, we, we've, it's easy for us. I think it's, I understand and completely get why a work like Steve Reich's Different Trains has an aesthetic that's much more in keeping with the ethos of memory culture today where you can sort of elegantly acknowledge the loss through the, through the idea of a void and that piece, uh, individual voices drop out and are taken, uh, they're, they're kind of ghosted by, by instrumental music lines. Its whole aesthetic is much more uh, current, if you will, um, but I don't think that that means, um, I don't think Survivor from Warsaw should be dismissed so easily, also because as a historian of this period, uh, looking into this piece opened up some really interesting angles of uh, insight I found into Schoenberg's own identity and said a lot about him and the era that he came from. Yeah. Is it also possible that <clears throat> You know, people are quite prim about art and, and, and don't really understand their preconceptions. So often when people are talking about great art, they mean somewhat narrow category that it embraces certain kinds of dialectical conflict that have to be worked out. It, it, you know, so something like uh, Hamlet, where it's, it's, it's really, the metaphor is a duel. But then you have other kinds of art like pastorals, uh, where it's not assumed that you're watching a conflict, but it's assumed that everybody in the audience is in sympathy with what's being offered. That's just another kind of art. Some might say it's not art. But it, it's, is it possible that one of the issues with a survivor of Warsaw is that it's presented as the kind of memorial where one might assume, like a pastoral, everyone would be sympathetic to it, and yet it's written in a dialectical form uh, and, and it so creates a frisson that, that can never be resolved. It's always going to evoke something. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a very good point. I mean, I think it does make certain um, assumptions about uh, a, a kind of sympathy on the part of an audience. Um, and it also, uh, it's interesting. I, I also just find it interesting that this piece gets attacked. This is, pro I think there's a case to be made that this is um, the most pop, Survivor from Warsaw is the most populist 
piece of 12 tone, 12 tone music that Schoenberg ever wrote, the most accessible, and it's interesting that even the one time Schoenberg does pivot to toward an audience and towards history and memory uh, in in his work, um, he's then attacked for being too Hollywood and too kitsch. So, um, yeah. Uh, Dan, would you, would you? You brought this up now. So if you have a category of pastorale, or you have a category of fanfare, let's say, and you know that it's for a specific time, a specific dedication, a specific uh, extra musical um, sense, why do you still then assume that you can't pass judgment and say that this is the best pastoral that has ever been written, this is the best fanfare that's ever been written, this is the best cantata? that's ever been written and judge this on the same category. It seems at least as musicians, from an aesthetic sense, that the demand is there for us to decide as a carrier quote of the tradition or of uh, explicating something uh, of the composer or even of the time. But that to not pass judgment, not allow yourself that, because you say that it is a, an icon that is outside of that, is to take this out of what we have to do as, as musicians and as performers, as composers, even as musicologists, to state, yes, this is a wonderful example, or we'll pass judgment in another 50 years or 100 years when we're, we're uh, further from it. Yeah, I, I appreciate your comment. I, th I think there may have been a, um, um, a little bit of confusion from my own um, remarks that I, I'm not advocating against judgment. I was just advocating for a kind of expanded set of criteria. Um, there, I, I think that we, 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 it's, we, we have to, as, as uh, audience members, historians, musicologists, performers, all, you know, that what we, do, what we do is judge. The question is on what, on what terms and, uh, and, you know, does it make sense to review the, uh, the Berlin uh, memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe to send an art critic who just came from the latest sculpture show at a different muse uh, Berlin museum and and kind of review it as aesthetic sculpture. Um, obviously, that's going to be part of a review, but um, can we can we also bring in a different a different set of considerations and respond to these works in a more holistic way? Um, and I, I think that oftentimes Survivor has been dismissed on those narrower terms. And I, I, part of the part of the project is to just raise some questions about how we should really be thinking about and yes, judging these works uh, in a way that's more responsive to what they are. Yes, 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 you. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm curious. When was the piece finally performed in Boston? Yeah, not until the 1960s, um, and it was performed uh, by Leinsdorf. And, uh, and yeah, it wasn't until the 1960s. Interestingly, in 1950, it made it to New York, New York Philharmonic under Metropolis, I mentioned. Everyone tuned in because they wanted to hear the national broadcast premiere that was scheduled uh, to, to take place after a couple of live performances. And, uh, and when Schoenberg's you know, fans around the country had been duly notified to listen out and they all turned, turned, tuned in, to that broadcast on that Sunday, and the piece had been taken off the program. It was the only piece that was not from the from the repeat from the live performance. It was the only piece that had been switched, and in its place, of all ironies, of course, was a Wagner overture. Yes, please. Have you done any research into what Schoenberg himself did during the war to um, bring attention to the plight of the Jews of Europe, and? Could there, been an, could there have been an element of guilt in the 1947s? Yeah, I mean, uh, so Schoen Schoenberg left Germany in, in uh, 1933, um, and he famously told Webern at that point that he wanted to dedicate his life's work to the, the Jewish national cause, were his words, um, and that he viewed this as a calling more important than his art. He had an uncanny uh, prescience, you could say, uh, uh, about the, the, the danger that, that European Jewry faced. And he worked with a spectacular passion and spectacular ineffectiveness uh, f for, for organizing uh, um, you know, p political awareness in this country. He had these visions of, of starting his own newspaper, uh, chartering a plane to, to deliver um, 
word to distant remote communities, he really went very deep into this idea that he could single-handedly go from being, in a way, the, the Moses of, of German music to the kind of the Moses of, of the Jews. And in a way, there's, uh, uh, I actually think, I'd like to think that in his, um, in his, in his propagandistic work, on, uh, his lobbying political work on behalf of the Jewish national cause in this country, we can think of him a bit as a kind of Aaron figure in that sense. Um, he was, at that point, trying to use words to convey this idea that he, that he had about what the uh, idea in the Moses and Aaron sense, um, and that in a way, after that failed spectacularly, the, the war had run its course in 1947, he's returning back to music and, uh, and in a way reverting, you could say uh, that Aaron wrote the text of the survivor from Warsaw and Moses wrote the music. I'm wondering uh, if you would comment on reception a little further in two parts. One is you've basically focused uh, and shared with us thoughts of music critics and other intellectuals on their response to this uh, work. What about perhaps members of the Jewish community or survivor communities that uh, in their embracing of this work? In addition, can you talk a little bit, I know it's a different topic, on this re reception in Europe? Yeah. I mean, just uh, on the easy, an easy one. On the, at the end, I would, if people are curious, I would, I would point you towards um, Joy Calico's book, um, published. That was a, a recent book that came out. All, all uh, it's called "Survivor from Warsaw in Postwar Europe," and she sees that this is that following this piece around its first European performances is this amazing window into the very, very different state of the national memory cultures in each country. So it's that's a huge topic. It was done completely different, responded to completely differently in each country, and in some cases, uh, actual survivors were recruited to, to take the role of the narrator part, you know, kind of adding a whole different element to things. Um, in terms of the reception in this country, it was, um, it, every performance that I've been able to find chronicle of um, uh, seems to suggest a, a really overwhelming popular approbation that it was really uh, accepted and, and celebrated um, by audiences. It did not get that many performances, it seems. The, uh, it's a little hard to piece together, but the royalty records in the archives suggest that, um, that it, it only got a handful of performances through the, the 50s and 60s. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to just to kind of think about I found it interesting as a historian, also a historian of memory, to, there's a big debate right now is at, at what point um, did we as a country become aware of the Holocaust? Um, what, for a long time people spoke about this latency idea that, that, that nobody was speaking or talking about the war un, uh, until maybe the Eichmann trial or until a German television miniseries or the Six Day War or this, there are different, but often people thought for years nobody was talking about it. What's interesting about Survivor is that you see, well, that's not really true. Kusevitsky and other kind of tastemakers may have had uh, may have had their own reluctance, and it was taboo in certain areas, but there were other communities, like the emigre community, which Kurt Frederick represents, and also audience members, of course, that had a very different and in some way open relationship to thinking about the war and memorializing it. Good. Thank you very much. Uh